Good evening, everyone. This is Senator Summers, and I am here tonight with a distinguished panel of physicians, superintendents, representatives from Ledgelite Health District. And this forum or town hall meeting is designed so that you can ask questions concerning the return of children to our schools uh, in the next week or so. Many of you have already submitted questions, so we will be answering those shortly. But if you have questions during this presentation, feel free to Facebook them and we will try to get to all of your questions. If by chance we run short on time, uh, we will try to get back to you individually on those questions. Uh, the first person I'd like to introduce tonight is Patrick Green. He's the president of l &M Hospital, which is affiliated with Yale. Patrick, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for sharing uh, your physicians with us this evening. And um, Patrick is gonna go ahead and introduce uh, the physicians that are joining us tonight. Patrick? Thank you, Senator Summers, and thank you for having us as always. We really enjoy participating in forums like this and anytime we can be helpful with educating the community about the pandemic and particularly now as we go into the opening of schools. Um, I'm pleased to be here uh, with uh, Dr. Rick Martinello. He is the medical director of infection prevention for Yellowhaven Health System. Uh, Rick has been a a uh, very, very helpful partner throughout this pandemic and, and a leader throughout the system. So very lucky to have him join us today. We also are fortunate to have Dr. Kevin Torres. Dr. Torres um, is our Associate Chief Medical Officer at l &M Hospital. And um, he has served many roles throughout this pandemic and uh, leading our efforts with testing and our surge plans. So uh, very fortunate to have Kevin with us today. Thank you, thank you very much. And I have the honor to introduce um, Chris Magnuson. She is from Ledge Light Health District. Um, originally, we were gonna have Steve Mansfield and he had some family issues. So Chris, who is the expert in this area has been kind enough to join us tonight, um, even though she's had a very, very full day. We also have uh, Superintendent Sean McKenna from Griswold School System. And we are honored to have Assistant Superintendent Marian Butler from the Stonington School District with us also today. So um, what I would like to ask is each panelist to just say a few words, um, introduce themselves, and then we will get right into the questions if that works for everyone. So I'm gonna start with uh, Assistant Superintendent Marian Butler. Afternoon, uh, Mary Ann Butler, Assistant Superintendent of Schools in Stonington. We're looking forward to seeing our children back in a hybrid model starting September 8th. Uh, families have uh, had the opportunity to just select from a full distance uh, learning model where children are learning from home for five days a week or uh, a model which, which we refer to like many other districts as a hybrid model, two days in according to the alphabet uh, and three days out. Wednesdays and Saturdays will be our deep clean day. We've worked uh, tirelessly with many of the area uh, superintendents and districts, many of which have a very similar plan. So happy to be here and thank you, Heather, for inviting me. Thanks for having me. I know, and I wanna say one thing, these superintendents and school districts and school boards have done just an amazing job in a very compressed period of time to try to get our kids back to school. So um, they are working really hard for the district. Dr. Torres, welcome. Hi, Heather. Nice to be with you. Uh, this is, uh, I think, our third one we've done. Uh, I hope it's helpful for everybody. We try to answer uh, as many questions as we can, and um, I can try to help what's going on locally uh, to try and help with the community, and um, appreciate you having us on. Great. Thank you for being with us. Dr. Martinello. Hi, Hi. and thank you also for inviting me to participate in this. Um, a, a little bit about me, I'm, I'm an infectious disease physician, and as Mr. Green mentioned, I'm the medical director for infection prevention for the hospital. Uh, one of my interests is how viruses are transmitted from one person to another, and I've worked in public health and infection prevention for over 15 years now, so I'm really happy to participate. Great, we're so happy to have you. Um, and we're going to bump over to Chris Magnuson. How are you, Chris? Oh, fine, thanks. Thanks for uh, having us. I'm sorry Steve couldn't be here. 
Um, I'm an infection preventionist and uh, I oversee communicable disease prevention and public health emergency preparedness. I work very closely with the infection prevention team at LNM Hospital. And lately we've been really busy working with all of the schools. And I have to say they have been putting in an incredible amount of time and energy into doing these plans. It's not easy. This is all new for everybody. So when we're not working with the schools, we're doing contact tracing. Thankfully, our numbers are lowering. We'd like to have them stay that way so that we can work on other things. Also, we're working very hard preparing for the flu season and for eventually for the COVID vaccine to be coming. So glad to be here. Thank you so much. We have Superintendent Sean McKenna from Griswold. Hi, Sean, how are you? Good evening, thank you. Uh, Senator Summers, and thank you for including us here. Um, good evening, fellow panelists and Facebook participants. I'm the proud superintendent of Griswold Public Schools. We've been working very hard with our community and our board of education in our town to put forward a plan to welcome students back on September 2nd in a hybrid model similar to Stonington. Um, we had our teachers come back today for six days of professional development. We are leaning into this together and we're looking forward to answering any questions that our community or neighboring communities may have. Great, well, thank you all so much. Um, we have this wonderful panelists and um, I'm really excited to have an opportunity for citizens, students, parents, teachers to ask questions directly to the experts. So what we're gonna do now is I have questions that have come in in advance, I will ask and uh, we can go through, you can jump in as you feel appropriate. And then if we have questions coming in through Facebook, um, we will continue to um, pass those through as time permits. So these are not in any particular order, um, but one of the first questions that we have is, um, has to do with, it's kind of long, so I'm gonna try to uh, paraphrase what they have here, but um, the virus has been shown to aerosolize. So it can be transported through the air for distances exceeding six feet, especially when talking and laughing. And this is typical of what students are doing during lunch. However, students need to drink and eat during lunch and remove their masks. So how can this be safe for students to be able to communicate and eat during lunch in an indoor environment, especially when schools have older ventilation systems? That's a good one to start off with. So how about Dr. Martinello, do, would you like to speak to that? And then we can go to Superintendents, Dr. Torres, that's that's a pretty common question that we get that parents are concerned about. And, and thank you very much for that question. I think it's, it's a really good one. And it, it, I think very well illustrates a lot of the complexities that we're dealing with. I think something that's really important to recognize is we, we never take, uh, in addressing COVID, we never take a single approach to how we prevent its transmission. And so while you know, masks are effective and especially effective if everybody is wearing a mask, other things that we do include social distancing. And so this, this is a really important intervention, especially in a lunchroom setting where people are eating and drinking. So of course they have their masks off. So in that setting, it's really important that we continue to try to maintain a uh, distance between people and make sure that the room is large enough to hold everybody and keep them distanced in a safe manner. Okay, and Dr. Torres, Chris Magnuson, would any of you like to weigh in on that? You know, you can see kids sitting in the lunchroom, they take their masks off. They don't always follow the rules as much as we'd like them to. Um, with concerned parents as far as the transmission of the virus? I can only speak for the plans that I've seen so far, but I think that a lot of thought has been put into um, what to do about lunch, staggered lunches, um, sitting uh, far away from one another. I, I think a lot of thought has been put into it. And believe me, you know, everybody's thinking of these things. We eat lunch at Ledge Light together in a big room, six feet apart, masks off, we've all been okay. So I think that um, parents also have to talk to their children ahead of time about the, the importance, you know, when they're at lunch, you know, not to be shouting and carrying on. And if they're gonna sneeze or cough to cover it quickly. Okay, does anyone else think, go, ahead. go ahead, Doctor. Yeah, I think, um, I, you know, I can't speak for the school districts, but I know they've done a lot of work and they're going back in a hybrid uh, model to try and limit the number of uh, students in the building so they can get that uh, appropriate spacing. 
and start out and see, you know, how they do with that. I think, you know, there's been a lot of talk about how can they take breaks and everything else, but, you know, people have been going outside and I think that'll probably be incorporated into some of the breaks. And I think you've seen through the summer, uh, we've done pretty well going outside and, and being active. And so I, I think, um, I think we got to give it a chance and uh, they've been doing a great job planning and uh, I think uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, right. Heather, from the school district standpoint, you know, we, we were trying to emphasize with the teachers and the students and the family that families that all of these things, the masks, the hand washing, the social distancing, they're all mitigation strategies. So they're not, not guarantees, but we know that there are things in combination that work or seem to work. Um, uh, and they're not guarantees again against infection, but again, they help us prevent that spread. And so this, the principals have been very creative depending on what their facility looks like about planning for using alternative spaces, um, spreading kids out, adding lunch waves. And again, with that hybrid model and having half of the load of children in the building at any time, if that, it's really gonna, it's really gonna be helpful to, and, and a little bit easier to maintain that social distancing and launch waves. Won't be perfect, we're dealing with children, uh, but I think uh, we've got some creative solutions to that. I, I think Heather, just to jump in to echo what everybody said, um, and we have these videos posted on our website. The CDC videos, they're short, and I would encourage families to take a look at them. But there's this graphic of a Swiss cheese for each and every mitigation strategy. And if you have the different mitigation strategies working together, social distancing, uh, spacing, staggered lunches, um, hand sanitation before and after, um, they do work in concert. Um, the research has shown it's not perfect, but part of our job is, and we're doing this with our faculty, is training people into this new norm um, with messaging and signage and sort of getting into the daily habit of not just social distancing, but washing your hands before and after lunch. And with the hybrid model, I know here in Griswold, we have approximately 1800 students. We've had a number of students who've opted to do um, what we call full remote learning. So we have about 200 students. We are gonna have that 50% capacity in our buildings to achieve what we had set out to do. Great. I think it's what you raised, all you, you all raised, that's very important, is that this is not perfect. This is a um, mitigation strategy um, that we don't have all the answers to every single thing, but we're doing our best under the circumstances that we have um, present, presented to us at this point in time. Um, that leads me to another question. I'm going to jump around because one is flowing into the other, which is um, we have many people, which I've just learned in East Lyme, there's a group actually um, suing over this, is why is wearing a mask important? And why should kids be wearing a mask in school? We understand that it's part of the mitigation strategy, but there are people that are um, indicating that masks don't work. So can you address that? I think that's very important to get out in the public. This is clearly a Dr. Martinelli or Dr. Torres or Let's Light Health District question. I'd be happy to go ahead and start. And you know, so I, I think like we've already said, you know, it, none of the individual acts that we take to try to prevent the spread of COVID is, is perfect. And masks certainly aren't perfect either, but we do know that masks work. And when, you know, when we look at what's happened in New York City and how they've kept the virus down, what's happened here in Connecticut and how we've managed to keep the virus down, we know that masks are really a large part of that. Since they're not perfect though, what really helps masks to be most effective is when both people are wearing them that may be interacting with each other and uh, that they're wearing them as often as, they, as possible. And so when we do that, we know that we, that really helps to help prevent the spread of uh, viruses. And you know, one other thing I'll add to that is we know that using masks are really safe. Um, and of course, you know, we know that while masks should not be used on children less than uh, two years of age. Uh, for everybody older than that, they're incredibly safe. And of course, here in the hospital, we, we have staff um, in our operating rooms who uh, wear masks all day long and don't have any adverse event, uh, effects from that. So they're really safe and they do help. Great. Thank you. Does anyone want to add anything to that? Um, I'll just add that we do contact tracing. So we talk to people who have COVID. And unfortunately, 
too often uh, we discover they didn't wear masks because they were around friends and they thought it was safe. And lately they've been younger, you know, young 20s and teens. And when we ask them if they wear masks, well, of course not, they're my friends, they're healthy. So we do know that masks work. And I think unfortunately people are getting tired and they see the numbers are low. So I think that people are not following the guidelines like they should. And so our fear is that we're gonna see the numbers go up. So masks do work along with all the other uh, mitigation strategies that are in place. Great, thank you for that. Um, so we have a question about IEPs and this is probably directed towards our superintendents. Um, we have parents asking about services and mobility of their student that may have special needs for IEP. Um, this is actually somebody from Groton, um, but I also have the same similar question from Stonington and actually from Griswold. They're not exactly the same, but they're very close. Um, asking about the fact that their child has a um, IEP and needs um, special services and there hasn't been much attention they're, they're saying for these particular issues. Is there some place that a parent could go um, on your website or contact you directly on the particular plan for their student? Would you so like Heather, as you know, with each IEP, it's a legal document and each case is individualized. Yep. And so what, we do have a special education section on our website, our, our director of special education, and I know the director in Stonington, um, they tirelessly to get back to parents as quickly as possible. And so that's part of that communication piece that I talked about in the pre-show, it's very important if you have a, a question regarding special education, if you're at the elementary school, you go to either an elementary principal, assistant principal, or the director of special education to get good information about your particular child. Okay, great. And, and it's important, Heather, because there are certain children that will be coming to school four days a week. There are certain children that need to, to learn remotely and have, re and have specific services received remotely. So it's hard to give a blanket answer on that. Just like Sean said, there are individual plans for a reason. So reach out to the case manager or the director of special ed or the building leader. But it's important that parents understand that you have not forgotten those children, that they will be included. Um, and if they're not getting the answer, they need to reach out to the case manager or the elementary school teacher who can get, I'm sorry, elementary school superintendent, so not elementary school. Principal well. or assistant yeah. principal, yep. That can lead them to the right uh, person to talk to. So that's really important. I can understand the concern there. Um, when, another question we have coming up is um, from, it's for Ledge Light Health District, actually. It says, as soon schools will be reopening, could Ledge Light Health District please give the COVID-19 cases and death rate by age group? data that's given to Connecticut from the HHS in a graphed form and could they put it on their website for parents and guardians to follow. This would be help to follow for younger age groups also any cases of zero to nine and 10 to 19 year olds that cannot be easily found or published. This would give parents um, confidence and um, that they were looking for. I don't know if Ledge Light can speak to that. I don't know if the hospital- Well, you'll find, you'll find that local health departments don't put that data out because of the fact that we have small towns mm -hmm. and uh, it's not really significant and it's going to only cause undue anxiety because mm -hmm. we've noticed that when we post deaths, you've probably noticed on Facebook that everybody's trying to figure out who that person is. Or when we even post in a town how many cases it goes wild on social media trying to figure out who that case is. So for privacy, but also too, people need to understand that the data that we're getting in is not always up to date. So we may be posting that there are five cases of COVID for the week, but that might've been from weeks ago because the labs, there's so many labs that are just overwhelmed. So it doesn't do any good um, to know. You could have, if we say there's a nine-year-old in the town with COVID, I mean, that child could be homeschooled. That child could have just come back from a trip. So it's really not valid information. It will do nothing except increase anxiety and also ca could cause a stigma for that person if they figure it out. In a small town, they probably will in no time. 
So no, we don't do it that way. That's why data comes out at the county level in Connecticut for that reason. Right, I remember we discussed that thoroughly in public in the public health committee on why that's not done. Um, so can the can the physician speak to have uh, has Connecticut seen uh, many cases of um, children with COVID and is that a misnomer that children do not get COVID? I'm looking at other questions here. Can you speak to that? Yeah, I, I can start with this. Um, you know, we, ch children do do get COVID although their rate of more serious illness is markedly less than what we see you know, with adults. And also it seems as though the younger children uh, don't spread COVID as readily uh, to one another as much as adolescents and uh, adults do. Um, you know, I know in our children's hospital, uh, the number of patients that we've cared for uh, in the hospital setting with COVID has been a, a, a very small fraction compared to uh, those that we've cared for on the adult side. Okay. Um, I have another question. It says, in late September or early October, a wide range of viruses and infections start circulating throughout our school system, causing large numbers of students and staff to present with coughs, sore throats, and fevers. How will all these students and teachers be handled? Will they be quarantined? And how we, will we know if this is COVID or just the typical viruses without frequent testing. It could be a large percentage of the school population that is affected by these types of illnesses each fall. So the first thing, Heather, if I could just jump in, one sure. of the things that, and, I, and I'm sure the doctors and the public will, will, will attest, if you feel sick, then you need to stay home. That's first and foremost. Secondly, um, we, you know, this is new terrain for all of us. I know the Ledge Light Health District uh, put out a wonderful chart um, to help us in that decision making, but it's by far, it's not perfect. Um, and we're going to have to take things case by case. I know Uncas Health District up here, we work very closely. Poor Patrick, I was on the phone with him, actually emailed him <laughs> times today because we're trying to get good information to make good decisions. Um, and that's not to say that the question that uh, you raise isn't a serious one, it is. Um, but we are trying to work with the medical professionals, with the public health officials, and with the town officials to make informed decisions. Yes, I know Chris wanted to weigh in there. Chris Benson. Well, we've been meeting with the schools and we've been meeting with the school nurses. And this is a big concern for everybody because this is new. And let's face it, in the fall, we've got flu, we see neurovirus, and a lot of the symptoms, they could be any number of things. And kids tend to get a lot of viruses. But to be on the safe side, um, the state has come out with a plan along with the Department of Education, where if a child has one symptom, and you know, I think you're gonna be posting the chart that uh, Mary did, um, you know, fever, chills, cough, shortness of breath, loss of taste of, uh, or smell, that's one we see commonly, uh, muscles, body aches, sore throat, you know, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, headache, fatigue. I mean, the list goes on and on. It could be any number of things, but to be on the safe side, the school nurses are going to assess the situation. A lot of them know the children well, and then they'll make the determination whether to call the parent to send them home. And in order for them to come back, you know, they need to either be tested or see a physician who's going to say, you know, their asthma is acting up, that's, that's why they were a little short of breath. And then they can return. If they don't do that, then they're gonna to be told to stay home for, for 10 days. This is new for all of us. Um, so I, I can only imagine as a parent um, how difficult all of this is going to be, but to be on the safe side for now, that's what the plans are. And we're really, we're really looking at training the teachers too. You know, I mean, we want the teachers to stay home if they're not feeling well. We want the parents to keep their kids home if they're not feeling well. But at the end of the day, like Chris said, we're going to rely on the nurses to work with the teachers if they believe a child is starting to show symptoms. And we have protocols in place so that we're not contaminating the building. You know, there's going to be an assessment on the nurse's part on how that child is going to be handled, whether they're going to be sent home in a containment room, whatever, whatever the case may be. So um, again, 
we're going to rely on our health professionals in the building, which is, is what we should do. And it's really nice to hear um, the collaboration that's been going on with Ledgelight in that manner. There's been a lot of intense work going on. So we appreciate that. Thank you. I also want to just say that as far as quarantine, um, that will be a decision that the local health with the school will determine. So if, if the room has great ventilation and the kids are six feet apart and the teacher can attest that they all wore the masks, no, the whole class may not be quarantined. It all depends on the situation. Each class, each classroom is going to be a little bit different. Those are all the things that we're going to have to look at. But um, that's, Chris, yeah. that's a great point because the, the, the teachers and the administrators and the families want us to run through every possible case. And it's so contextualized that that's the biggest message we have is if we have a positive case, whether it's staff or student, we're going to call ledge light and they're going to be the ones that we take our directive from. I think that's important because another question I just got was if there's one and um, for the physicians to weigh in on this also, if there's one positive in the school, uh, does the whole school get quarantined or just the classroom? And, and, you know, I, I, I think we see the same kind of uh, situations, you know, in our hospitals and in some of our offices where we occasionally have, you know, patient not suspected to have COVID who turns out to have COVID. And, you know, as it was said by Marianne, you know, e each of these situations, oftentimes it's best to really consider them on a case by case basis. Uh, if people are doing what they're supposed to be doing, they're wearing masks, they're staying apart as they can. You know, I think then it's a reasonable consideration about how do you limit who needs to self quarantine after that. Um, and, and we've, I think over the last several months have found some success in that in the hospital setting. I'd also say, I mean, you're, you're definitely gonna need to be flexible. There's no question about it. Um, I think that's important. I think Mary Ann's highlighted that. And you know, a lot of work's gone in. I will say the visiting nurse, uh, the, the actual uh, nurses that work in the schools have helped in our tent uh, for our testing for the last three to four months. Mm -hmm. They're a great bunch of people. We really appreciate all the work they've done. And I, I think you're in good hands. I think that I know they've already been working hard to set up the appropriate situations in the school and you know, we need to, need to be flexible and uh, take each case and, and work through it and uh, make decisions from there. If I could just say one more thing, and I think Mary Ann sort of touched upon this. Um, school nurses, always have to contend with a child that's sent to school sick with and been dosed with Tylenol before they're sent to school. And, and we all understand sometimes why these things are done, but we can't have parents doing that now. We just can't take that chance. And we have to remember too, we've had a hard time with people understanding that they can be positive for, for COVID, but not have any symptoms. And so that's where we really need to have the parents work closely with the school and let them know that their child has tested positive so we can know, so we can start contact tracing. And so, you know, we just wanna make sure that parents are not sending kids to school sick, that they're gonna be honest about this and think about not just their child, but the other children in the classroom. Um, this, Unfortunately, during H1N1, we had a lot of situations with kids being dosed with Tylenol, sent to school, and then the parents couldn't pick them up right away. That can't happen, not with COVID-19. It's very different. Okay, um, that follows up with another question. It says, will the school nurses have access to be able to be doing COVID testing in the school? No, not in Griswold. Okay. However, however, Heather, you know we have a good partnership with UCFS up here. And so we would work in collab. That's one of our wraparound services. We would work with UCFS. My understanding is you can get a test at UCFS Griswold at this point in time. Great. I think they're probably asking, are they going to do it like in the nurse's office, just from what they're saying? And the answer is no. Is yeah, I haven't heard any discussion of that. Yeah, so I would just say, you know, the way we do our testing now, anybody that's symptomatic, mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're wearing uh, masks and face shields to, to take those uh, samples. It really wouldn't be the setup in the school to do that. So. That makes a lot of sense. Okay, we have another one here, which is for the uh, superintendents. Um, 
what options do I have as a parent if I can't homeschool and I don't like the district plan that my town has come up with? Anyone? The question is if I can't homeschool and I don't like the distance, so they don't like the hybrid plan or the option for full, does that include full remote learning? It just says, what do I do if I cannot homeschool, uh, but I don't like the district plan that my town has come up with? So that's that's a tough, tough um, answer to get to. I'll, I'll sort of tag team it with Marianne. I know that you know all districts are offering obviously the hybrid model with the intention, the hope that we will go full-time in person um, when we have um, sustained data um, and, and support from the public health officials. Having said that, we've all developed um, remote learning plans, distance learning plans for parents and students who opt to do that full time to the extent that a lot of districts, I know Stonington has, so is Griswold and Montville, we've brought in uh, professional development uh, experts to work with our teachers to make sure that that distance learning is as robust as it can be. Um, we brought in a, a group out of Providence, Rhode Island that's uh, affiliated with the Highlander Institute that specializes in blended online learning and teaching. Um, we had a number of pre-service seminars for our teachers already. I know Mary Ann's working with a very highly talented um, group from EastCon. So we're, we're trying to do it the best way we can. Um, Mary Ann? Yeah, and I think, I think my question would be, I don't know enough, Heather, about what the objections are, whether it's, um, you know, I don't feel comfortable with the, the material. I don't, I, is it a technical, you know, a computer issue? So I would encourage whoever that, person is in whatever district they are to reach out to the building principal um, or the assistant superintendent and see what ideas might be a fit for that person. It may be um, a situation where they could help, you know, find, we could find a neighbor that could um, accommodate uh, supervising that child, or there might be some other um, programs that would actually help you may maximize the offerings that the district has. And, and at the end of the day, that's all we have. And we, our options right now are the child can be homeschooled, the child can participate in full distance learning, or the child can participate in the hybrid model in Stonington. That's what we have. Um, and, you know, we certainly want to keep all of our children engaged as, as to the extent possible. But again, I don't really have enough information about what the, what the sticking point is for that particular family. That gives them a good resource. So I'm getting a bunch of new ones in, but some of them are very similar. So I'm gonna try to put them together. Um, this is just an example. Groton Public School House school, school is offering all day tree house care on Wednesday. They have cohort A and cohort B separated. So all kids, but all kids are gonna go to the tree house on Wednesday. How is that supposed to keep the kids separated? It makes no sense safety wise. I have the same question in a different fashion, and this is directed for the clinicians. If you have kids that are cohorted in A or B that go to school Monday, Tuesday, or then Thursday, Friday, and they're separated when they get to the school by their classrooms, but they're all traveling on the same bus, how does that keep them safe? Who would like to answer that one? <laughs> yes, I'll start. Okay. Yeah. I'll start. Uh, so the the school bus, um, I know that comes up as a, a big concern. I think there's a few things. I know in Stonington, and I can't speak for other areas, they've asked for uh, parents' help in driving their students to school. Uh, so that will cut down some of the people on the bus. Uh, that's a, They're also um, obviously going with the hybrid so that, again, limits the number of people on the bus. Um, I think also you can, you can be creative on the bus. I think, you know, you um, you put one uh, child in the seat, um, you can stagger them, uh, one towards the aisle, one towards the window, open windows. I mean, you, again, you have to be creative, have to be flexible about it. But I think there's ways you can do it. Yeah, and, and I think the, the only thing I, I would add, and you know, Dr. Torres touched on this a bit, is what, what the ventilation on that bus is. 
and what can be done by the you know, the bus driver and the bus company to try to to really maximize that. You know, we do know that you know with improved ventilation, it's going to decrease the risk of transmission of the virus from one to another. That brings me to another question. These are not in order. Is is it necessary to wear a mask outside? If you're going to be near other people or even have the, the possibility that you could be, then yes, you, you should be wearing a mask while, you, while you're outside. And so I would think, um, you know, for example, during recess, uh, you are interacting with other kids. And while we're making every attempt to stay uh, distanced at least six feet from each other, we know that, you know, kids being kids and adults being adults. You know, for that reason, you know, for that matter, um, sometimes they do get closer than that six feet, even if they're trying. And so that for that reason, wearing a mask even outside when you are in a situation uh, that has uh, uh, where you may be in contact with people, you should still wear a mask. Great. Okay. I have um, somebody who keeps texting the same question. So I'm, I'm going to ask it because they really want it answered. It says, I understand that creative solutions have been developed with expert advice. I just wonder what the schools are doing for the mental health strain that this puts on both the students and the teachers. So, oops, I just lost my, sorry. And, and administrators, this is scary stuff in the world. What types of things are schools going to do to make sure that worries are heard and handled in the most effective way. Nothing is perfect, but I do want to stress the importance of mental health, especially for those families who do not have the luxury of going to an outside therapist due to financial difficulties or even work obligations. Well, so, I'd, like to, I'd like to give a nod to the State Department of Education um, for, for giving permission, which is really, you know, it, teachers are pleasing people and they want to do the right thing. And, and the Department of Ed has been very, very clear that they want the emphasis to be on social emotional learning, not just the first two weeks, but really throughout the year, they've, they've relaxed the teacher evaluation system to focus on social emotional learning. We are sending the message to our teachers that that's what we want you to be doing. Don't worry about assessing. Don't worry about trying to make up content. You got to figure out where the children are emotionally before we can even address the academic piece. We're doing the same for our teachers, the same for our administrators, that that has to be, if we don't have healthy, mentally healthy staff, um, we're not going to have mentally healthy kids. And so that's been um, some things we're working on. We've worked on as an administrative team over the summer. And again, we'll be doing some work with our uh, staff when they come back and making sure that that message is loud and clear on planning for those first couple of weeks because they're critical. And to echo what Marianne said, we are grateful that the um, State Department of Education is taking social and emotional learning quite seriously uh, before COVID. Um, but we have, for instance, we have tried to put our team here some practical steps into place. So for example, our PD with our teachers, it's very, very flexible this week. We actually, we have Friday, they still have a long weekend. Um, we are starting our school year next week, Monday, uh, two, excuse me, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. There are half days to ease into things. We are also, to echo what Marianne said, we're not emphasizing the first month of school heavy testing and heavy lifting. It's about reacclimation, and it's about being a supportive community at all levels, at the Board of Ed level, with the administration, with our teachers, and with our students and our families. Great. Thank you. I have a couple more questions that these ones are directed for the clinicians. Um, and it says, um, it is important that Connecticut continues, I don't know who these are from actually, uh, to lead the way on combating the spread of this virus. If a rapid test such as the Yale School of Public Health and Epidemiology of Micro Microbial Diseases receives FDA approval, um, do you think that schools should be screening students and staff on a daily basis? Yeah, we, we, we know that, that there is a, a role for testing. However, uh, the benefit there is really when uh, there's, um, you know, when the risk is really the highest. And so where we see, you know, some good applications of testing are for groups that are, are living together. So for example, in uh, some colleges, it's become very common for them to implement 
uh, testing on a periodic basis for uh, students who are residing in the dorms. Um, you know, for kids who are, are living at home, high school students, you know, living at home, you know, the, the importance of that becomes less so. But what it gets replaced by is uh, how we consider people's health before they come to school. So making sure that their temperature is checked, you know, making sure that they're checking their symptoms and thinking about whether or not they may be sick. And like was said before, making sure that if we may be sick, staying home from school so that just in case we are, we're not exposing our classmates and our teachers. Great. Dr. Torres, do you want to weigh in on that? Oh, I don't have much more to add than that. It's <laughs> okay. pretty, pretty appropriate. Um, well, the person that asked the questions about the cohorting um, feels that we did not address um, the issue well enough. I just got a text. Can you please address the question about co-mingling? Kids from both cohorts together in a paid program on Wednesday while the school is deep cleaning, which I think I did mention, but what are the safety protocols that you would have? I guess they're saying you have these two separated cohorts during the school, during Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, but they're all coming together at one place called Treehouse on Wednesday. So you're not really keeping those groups separate. Any thoughts on that? You know, Heather, I would just jump in and to say that um, I, I, it's not what, what I would recommend. I'm a parent too at the end of the day. And I actually, I happen to be a parent in Groton. And so what I would advise this individual, and I think it's a legitimate question. I'm not here to disparage or discredit. Again, go to the school or contact central office and say, I have these questions. They're legitimate. What can you offer me as a concerned citizen, as a taxpayer, and as a parent? That is the best avenue. I mean, for me to speak about Groton or Stonington or Preston, it's not my place as, as a superintendent. I can talk about it for, for Griswold and what we're doing here. But we, we have to, and I get it, I get parents are very, very concerned. We've got to get out of the indictment culture, and we have to go directly to source and get the information that we need. And Heather, there's nothing to say that, you know, um, 10, 10 sets of families aren't putting their kids in various daycares or various settings on those deep clean Wednesdays. And we don't have any control over that either. So, you know, it, it might be a more public way that it looks like there's commingling. And again, I don't know the specifics of how the program is set up and I don't speak for Groton, but you know, it, uh, we don't have control over what's happening when the kids are not with us in the building during the quote unquote formal school day. And that's, that's the analogy I would use. But again, I would encourage that parent to, to go to the appropriate building um, and supervisor in Groton. Right. And I, I do believe it's, it's similar. I do know that, you know, whether it's a daycare center, um, you know, they have say, similar protocols they have to follow. Um, they are under the guise and direction of ledge light and what they've heard from the medical community on distancing and sanitation and mask wearing and all those things. They're, it's not... Um, it can't be a free for all at a, at a daycare center, but I agree. So if you have a specific question like this, go to the actual direct superintendent or the administrator of that district. And I'm sorry that they, Dr. Grenier was not able to meet with us tonight because he has a board of education meeting. Um, otherwise he would have been here tonight. So um, we, have a we have quite a few more questions. So I'm gonna try to go quickly so we can try to get through them. Um, this is from a bus driver asking the clinicians what can a bus driver do to protect themselves carrying many children on the bus? Yeah. No, I'd suggest um, obviously they're wearing their masks. Um, they wash their hands, obviously. They could probably have um, the uh, Purell or whatever uh, solution they're using as the um, kids are getting on the bus, uh, making sure all the kids are wearing masks as they get on uh, and then helping to space out. and then, Again, it's all these different things you put in place to try and protect everybody. Yeah. I, I think the, the only thing I'll add to Dr. Torres's response is that, uh, you know, making sure that the ventilation is turned all the way up on the bus and making sure that the vent is set to draw in the fresh outside air rather than recirculating the air on the bus. And finally, if the weather is permitting, uh, it's not raining or snowing, et cetera, outside, uh, keeping the bus windows open a little bit uh, to help circulate the air a little bit more, uh, you know, I think also is helpful. 
Great. Chris, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? No? Okay. Okay. Um, this again is, this is kind of directed to both uh, the superintendents and to our uh, medical experts. Uh, what are your thoughts on the vaccine, especially because it's been fast tracked? Would you get the vaccine yourselves? And if it becomes available, will the schools allow the vaccine to be administered in, administered in the school by the school nurse? That's a loaded question. <laughs> so clinicians, what are your thoughts on the quote fast tracked uh, vaccine and would you be willing to get it yourself? That's the first part of it. And then if it's available, school mm -hmm. districts, would you be willing to allow it to be administered um, by the school nurse in your uh, facility? <laughs> I'll, I'll say that I, I, I am very pleased to see how the federal government has really been putting in, you know, what, what's turning out to be billions of dollars into accelerating vaccine you know, research and development uh, so we get a COVID vaccine. You know, I think it, it is going to take some time still. I'm anticipating that we're not going to see a vaccine available to the public, you know, probably until at least this next calendar year. Um, we do have a really outstanding uh, vaccine safety program in the United States uh, where we see you know, uh, organizations such as Veterans Affairs and the Department of Defense that used you know, hundreds of thousands of doses of vaccines and they pool their data together to you know, look at issues of safety and ensure safety. Uh, but also with the FDA, we have a, a really robust process uh, to ensure that vaccines that are approved by the FDA um, are uh, safe and effective. Now, of course, this year, you know, as was asked with the question, you know, we have a lot of concern about how uh, these timelines are being pushed. And I think this is where, we, uh, you know, we really rely on our public health experts, uh, both at the, the federal level, the state level, the local level, and also our, our other experts in infectious diseases, in, in vaccines, et cetera. So there, there is a lot of people, you know, looking at uh, how effective these vaccines are going to be, how safe these vaccines are going to be. And I think we need to listen to those public health and uh, experts and those scientists, and they're going to help us un understand, you know, whether it's safe or not. Um, you know, would I? I think, it, uh, you know, would I volunteer for a study? Absolutely. You know, I think, um, like anybody volunteering for uh, any any research, it's really important to make sure that you understand what you're getting into. You understand what's known about the vaccine uh, beforehand. And you talk, you know, just as we're talking about, to, you know, talking with leadership at schools, if you have questions, you know, if you have the opportunity to be part of vaccine research, I really encourage you to do that. And uh, it's very important to talk to the investigators to see what's known about the vaccine and, and uh, what advice they have if you're thinking about uh, joining such a trial. I'd also... I'd also put in, um, you know, I think it's very important to consider, obviously, a, a new vaccine uh, for COVID, but also definitely consider, make sure you're getting your flu vaccine this year. I mean, we saw, we mentioned the H1N1 a few years ago, and it, it, we, we weren't getting the flu vaccines as much as we, we are probably now. And I can, I can tell you, we definitely see lighter flu uh, seasons now that over the last few years that um, the flu vaccine has been become much of a much more prevalent and more people are getting it. And so, um, you know, we're lucky with Yale, they're going to be uh, joining up with Pfizer to be doing a, a trial for the uh, vaccine with Pfizer. So we'll certainly be looking into that, and seeing how that goes along. But we definitely want to encourage um, a flu vaccine. And we're hoping, you know, people are wearing their mask and social distancing and cleaning their hands. Maybe we could have a, uh, a low um, flu uh, season and, and COVID together, that would be great. Okay, um, this one is specifically for Dr. Martinello. Um, can you define what deep cleaning days entails or should entail? And I'm not really sure if this is for Dr. Martinello, but that's who they said it was for. I guess, can you define what deep cleaning days are in the schools and how can you be checking to be sure the cleaning is properly done and what credentials do they need to have to report, perform this work? Um, and what should they be doing? I guess for Dr. Martinello or Dr. Torres, what should they be doing 
um, and this is a follow up to one of the answers about the deep cleaning on Wednesday. Is that something that is um, that's approved by Legislate Health District on how they disinfect? Or I, I think they're asking like, how do you know that the areas have been disinfected? Is there a special process, a special approved person who does the kind of cleaning? Um, and what, it, what kind of cleaning is, is included in that deep cleaning on Wednesday? I, I, I think I can answer part of that question. And if, if there is any, anything good about the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID, uh, we do know that it, it, it is very easily killed uh, by any variety of different cleaning agents. And um, you know, I think what, what's really most important is that you know, one, we're using a cleaning agent you know, that's been shown to be effective against similar viruses. So we know that's going to be effective against this coronavirus, uh, but also that the, the housekeeping staff that are doing the cleaning are, are trained in how to, to use those products and they know what surfaces that uh, need to be cleaned. And typically what, what's really focused on are the, uh, what we refer to as the high touch surfaces. And so not only all the regular surfaces that people may be touching, but are paying special attention to ensuring that light switches, doorknobs, and other, other uh, objects that are gonna be touched frequently by people in the space are really uh, cleaned very appropriately. Would anyone else like to add this? Sure. The, the one thing that we've really emphasized to the schools, uh, they know how to clean. They do. But what we really emphasized is that um, they need to follow the directions of their cleaning materials because there's a certain amount of contact time. So we keep reinforcing that don't spray and wipe, spray and let it sit and follow the directions. <clears throat> and, you know, as Dr. Martinello said, coronavirus excuse me, it's pretty easy to kill most products out there, Lysol, any number of things uh, work against it. Senator Summers, our plan, we do have that outlined and all of our cleaning products are, are aligned to the Connecticut School Green Cleaning Law, as well as the Environmental Protection Agency List N. Additionally, we work closely with HD Seeger. That's our risk management company. They actually sat in on our school reopening committee and they do train our faculty, well, our staff, our custodial staff. So we are, you know, taking it seriously and consistent with the different, um, the different environmental agencies that we have to respond to. Good. Stonington is doing something very similar and any parent who wants to get information about that can go to the district website or the school website where we have both the district plans around, you know, ventilation as well as custodial practice, deep cleaning and routine cleaning, distinguishing between areas that are routinely cleaned versus deep cleaned. The custodians have been practicing this for months now. Um, and again, if there's any really uh, nitty gritty question in Stonington, um, you can certainly reach out to Peter Anderson, our facilities director, who can answer anything you want about cleaning products or, or processes. Great, thank you. Um, this is a follow-up question to the clinicians. Um, they said to keep the bus windows open after for ventilation. After using the senior center for the election, we were told that we could not use the fans with the doors open this, they must be in the senior center bus for the election. We were told we could not use the fans with the doors open because it would be passing the germs around. Is there guidelines for a room in the building or, or other uh, with doors being open or in using a fan? Yeah, so, so where, where that specific recommendation comes from is uh, that there was a study of a, a restaurant in China, you know, and what, what they had found was uh, in this restaurant, there was an air conditioner that was blowing air in one particular direction. It crossed a table you know, where there was a sick individual and people in a table that were downwind uh, from that individual ended up getting sick. And I, I think there is an important lesson here. And you know, when you do have fans in an area, you do not want sick people to get in front of those fans and have their germs blown all over the place. But beyond that, um, you know, if you can keep, you know, people who are, are sick out of those spaces, if you, um, if you just have improved the general ventilation of the space, 
that is really beneficial. And I think that's where, uh, you know, we can use fans where we can keep windows open, et cetera. Right. Um, this next question is a follow-up to what we were just talking about with the cleaning products. Um, it sounds as though they should contact their uh, individual school district, but it's asking, are the products used likely that kill COVID likely to cause breathing issues for children and adults in the building? And it sounds like they've all been approved by the- um, They're the, all EPA approved. So that shouldn't be an issue. Uh, but they could also check with the school district directly to find out what those products are as, as we all have mentioned. Um, the next question is for Lake like Health District. I know we're running out of time here, uh, but they're asking if something happens in the school, how quickly is Ledge Light Health District notified and how quickly can they respond? We can't, as soon as, <clears throat> excuse me, as soon as we hear, um, one of our staff will be calling the school and we'll follow up. We have over 23 staff. There's two of us that are nurses that do the contact tracing and the schools all have our cell phone numbers. So I don't think there'll be any issues with trying to reach us, one of us. Um, do the superintendents feel that that is accurate? You have such a close relationship, you would clearly pick up the phone and call them. And so- I can tell you right now that Patrick McCormick, I've been on my computer at 4.30 in the morning and He's I have emailed there. him and he's responded at 4.32 a.m. Yep. Yeah, and Ledge Light has right. been the same. We've had calls and situations, a variety of contexts, and um, amazingly, amazingly responsive. Um, and typically those, those situations and questions always come in on a Friday afternoon. So that's kind of the measure, right, Sean? If it's not at, at an odd hour in the middle of the night, it's a Friday afternoon. So I have great confidence, and I hope that the families um, are feeling some relief when they hear that. Great, and I have to attest to that too. I call both of them all the time for different things and they always pick up um, yeah. in the night or early in the morning. Heather, um, they, Chris has worked with us at, at L&M constantly with our infection uh, control person, Donna Nucci, and they've done a phenomenal and job. So they're, we've they're on top. in the middle of the night too. <laughs> That's right, we have. <laughs> Great, so the last question I've, um, I had is overall, if we can go through, do you feel that it is safe for our kids to return to school? Let's start like with- I'll uh, start. Okay, go ahead, Dr. I'll start. So I have uh, three kids. Um, they're looking forward to going back to school. I appreciate everything that the um, school districts have done to try and get us back and um, I think, you know, it's a whole community effort. I think, again, it's masks, washing your hands. It's, you know, not sending your kids to school when they're sick, um, traveling appropriately. You know, those are all things we got to do as a community to try and make this work. Great, thank and, you. I, I have four kids myself and that they're, they are all uh, heading back to school, uh, two of them already there. And, you know, I think like Dr. Torres was saying, you know, this, this is a community responsibility. You know, it's, it's, it's not only the schools, but it's, it's our families themselves too, and the kids. And we all need to be on uh, the same page as best as we can be. And we all need to understand that we're really truly in this together. And uh, we can't send our, our kids uh, sick to school, but also we need to reinforce what the schools are saying. Uh, we need to make sure that our kids uh, understand what the rules are and they know that the rules are important and they follow them. Yes, it's, it's safe to send students back to school. And as I mentioned previously, I have three children. They've been actively involved with a club sport this summer with swim. I have a son that works at McQuaid's. Uh, also been involved with a, a, a sport. And I think it helps when we work together. We are stronger when we work together. When we start getting into the indictment culture and pointing fingers, that's when we run into problems. And again, I can't emphasize this enough. If you, if you have a question, we get it. We're here to help. You go to the appropriate person. Thank you. We do have all the mitigation um, protocols in place. And we've had tremendous support from our families, um, everything from making masks to getting school supplies together. And, and I think as long as everybody understands it's a dynamic situation and to be flexible, um, we're gonna, things will be changing and we'll be adjusting things and tweaking things as we go on. But we're really looking forward to seeing the kids in a few short days. Great, thank you. Well, I'm happy to see all the hand washing, especially in schools. That doesn't always happen. 
So I think that uh, if everybody works together that we will see less flu, neurovirus and COVID, but also we need to remember what happens outside of school. And that's up to the, the parents and the community to ensure that what happens um, outside of school is just as important as what happens in school, that the mitigation strategies still are important. Great. Well, I wanna thank all of you and I wanted to give you an opportunity if you have any closing remarks, um, anything else that you would like to share uh, before we end our um, meeting tonight. Um, I wanna first thank the superintendents for taking this hour out of your day because I know it's critical time for you right now and it, you've done an amazing job in your school districts uh, preparing your schools for our kids to go back in a safe environment. Um, also to Chris, I know it's a really long day for you and thank you for coming tonight and to our clinicians for being here. I know how crazy your schedules are and I, we all really appreciate it. The community appreciates being able to ask these questions. So I just wanted to give you an opportunity if you have anything else you would like to share before we end tonight and I will start with Chris. Uh, please feel free to call us with questions. We're getting a lot of questions and I'd rather put people's mind at ease than have them listen to the wrong information or read the wrong information. Great. Dr. Torres? Oh, I just thank you for having us on. Um, I'd let you know that, uh, you know, our hospitals are here if you need us. And uh, hopefully this uh, fall, we all do the right things and, you know, good hand washing and masks and, and we're able to have a good fall and get things back somewhat to normal. Great. Dr. Martinelli. Uh, well, th thank you also for inviting uh, me to participate. Uh, you know, I think something really important to take away is, is how much effort has really been put in uh, to not only make uh, our schools the safest environments possible, but also to, to allow them to continue to be areas for learning and for socializing. And understanding that with all that effort, you know, we, we know we still didn't get it right and we're gonna to need to make adjustments and, and we hope everybody can be kind to each other and help to understand uh, that we're all doing the best that we can. Great. Miriam? Sure, I'd just like to tell the families that we understand that you entrust us with your most precious commodity, your children. And uh, please, if you have questions or anxiety, we understand that. But um, instead of getting your information over the cantaloupes at, uh, cantaloupes at McQuaid's, call us, call, call it uh, your principal or central office. We'll find the right uh, person for you because misinformation and rumors are our biggest enemy at this time. Thank you. Sean? Well, first of all, I'd like to thank my board of ed who's surrounding me right now. They're waiting patiently for me to start a meeting at six o'clock. But I want to, I want to, I want to, having said that, thank you to the board of ed, to the community of Griswold, to the parents that are donating their time with masks and trying to get good information out there. There's, there is a lot of positive that's coming out of this. And if we can all tap into that, we will be stronger together. Great. Well, I, again, thank you all for being panelists tonight. Um, your time is greatly valuable. And I hope that people that were watching had their questions um, answered. If you did not get your question answered, you can email us and we will forward it to the appropriate person to have it answered for you. Uh, but we're going to be back again with a, another panelist um, group here as we continue as things progress. And we're going to continue to have updates how they affect you and be able to have you ask the questions to the experts because we think that's important as um, all have said, especially uh, Marianne, we don't want to get you having your information over the cantaloupes at McQuaid's <laughs> or on the forum. We want you to be able to get your questions asked from the, from the experts. So thank you. Thank you to the Griswold Board of Ed for um, allowing Sean to go over time here. He does a great job. And um, thank you all for joining us tonight and good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.